Okay, good afternoon. I'm Catherine Ormerod. I'm the VP of Programs and Partnerships here at Living Beyond Breast Cancer. And I'd like to welcome you to our afternoon session, How Scientists Scientific Research is Addressing Metastatic Breast Cancer. We know this is a subject many of you are interested. We welcome both our in-person audience as well as our web streaming audience. You will have an opportunity after uh, the lecture to text your questions, and we will put the text number up on the screen at the appropriate time. So I am going to introduce the first of our two speakers, Catherine O'Brien. Catherine is a graduate of the University of Illinois. She is a gifted, uh, she had a, has an English degree, but she's a gifted writer and has really used those gifts since, she, particularly since she's been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in 2009. She is a board member of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. She is my co-chair on the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance um, Awareness Task Force, and she's an incredible advocate. So without further ado, Catherine. Thanks everyone. Um, and I'd like to uh, first thank uh, Living Beyond Breast Cancer for this opportunity to address my fellow metastatic breast cancer patients. And um, we're so glad, you know, for those that had hoped to join us and uh, weren't able to, but are following us online, um, we are thinking of you. And uh, just one housekeeping note in that regard, um, the reason I'm standing behind the lectern is um, I'm not actually wearing any pants. Um, just kidding. This is a, this is a G-rated conference. So anyhow, um, today, um, Today I'd like to do um, uh, about three things in the short amount of time that I have. And that would be to tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about metastatic breast cancer, and then address uh, some uh, hurdles to research and what we as patients can do. And then finally, uh, Mark Hurlbert from the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance is going to um, talk to you about epidemiology and some of the issues that I will be touching upon. So uh, in short, I will be very much uh, like, uh, you know, a Hawaiian shirt on a fat man. And what I mean is uh, I'm going to cover a lot of ground uh, very loosely. <laughs> so without further ado, let's begin. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, if you are here at lunch, um, this is already old news, but try and pretend like you haven't heard it. Uh, again, uh, I was diagnosed de novo, meaning I started with metastatic breast cancer in uh, 2009, and I had a small volume of bone mets. I was 43 when I was diagnosed. I will be 52 this year. Uh, thank you. And um, although it isn't really, I cannot, you know, and I do have to emphasize this, I can't take credit for that. I have just been incredibly lucky as a patient. It's not like I tried harder or I did anything special. I just was very fortunate to have a slow-growing cancer. Two years ago, uh, liver mets joined the party, and uh, Kathy already told you about some of the things that I do. I also wanted to say um, I'm a volunteer, and um, I do this because it's important to me, and I want to make a difference. And I'm so glad that we have the Hear My Voice advocates because your voices are very badly needed, so thanks for being here. Uh, one of the themes that you've heard about today is the number of people living with metastatic breast cancer. And as you know, we don't actually know because we only count those who present with a de novo diagnosis, who start out with the disease. So we estimate that there's 155,000 people, but we don't actually know. Uh, in terms of metastatic breast cancer, um, you know, no one dies from early stage breast cancer. When metastatic, it's not the lump, it's when cancer spreads beyond the breast, usually, you know, bone is the most common site of metastases. Bone, liver, brain, lung. Um, now you have metastatic breast cancer and now you have a problem. Um, 
And again, as I mentioned during launch, I am in the minority. Most people do not start, most people do not start as I did with a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. And that is why it is so important to track people because the majority of people living with metastatic breast cancer started out with early stage disease and had a metastatic, metastatic recurrence. And that's why we want to be counted while we, were still, while, while we are still alive. Just two quick points on this slide. I think most people in this room would be painfully aware of the difference between early stage and metastatic breast cancer. But I have starred the two things that are most important for this particular talk. And um, can you, uh, okay, I just want to make sure I could still be heard. So um, again, we can see um, uh, with early stage breast cancer, all cancer cases are counted at from initial diagnosis. With metastatic breast cancer, you're only counted if you're a de novo presentation. Mark is going to talk a lot about research, but I want to point out that although um, you know, we, do, we have 99.9% .9 of the mortality with metastatic breast cancer, our slice of the uh, research pie is pretty slim. It's only 7%. This slide looks rather complicated, and I would say please don't be intimidated. There's three things that you should know after I talk about this slide. You should know what is your breast cancer subtype, how common is that subtype, how many other people might be like you with that subtype, and finally, where did your breast cancer start? In terms of subtype, um, and our speaker, this, our keynote speaker today went over some of these things, but the most common uh, subtype of breast cancer would be ERP or positive, HER2 negative. That's about 40% of people with metastatic breast cancer. You can see that accounts for 40%, uh, that is 40%. Luminal B would be 20%. HER2 positive, also called HER2 enriched, is 10 to 15%. And then we have basal-like, or more, more commonly known as triple negative, or TNBC, and that is 15 to 20%. So just to use myself as a quick example, I am estrogen receptor positive. So I would be uh, uh, having drugs that would be uh, anti-estrogen. Uh, I'm ERPR positive, HER2 negative. Um, for most people, where did your cancer start? In the milk ducts. We've heard about invasive ductal carcinoma. For, that's about 90% of people with breast cancer. About for 10% of people, their cancer started in the milk lobes, and that's lobular cancer. And that is important to know for people with metastatic breast cancer because there can be a different pattern of metastases. People with lobular breast cancer can experience uh, GI metastases, abdominal met metastases, ovarian, uh, just to name a, t a few. And um, I would stress that it does not mean because you have lobular cancer, your cancer is automatically going to spread to those places. Not at all, but you should know, be aware of that, and it's something you might want to talk to your doctor about. Uh, your subtype is your roadmap to treatment, so it's important to know what your subtype is. If you don't know what your subtype is, it is in your pathology report, and if you have any questions or you need clarif clarification, talk to your oncologist or nurse and have them go over this with you. Um, Genomic testing is gaining traction, and I, I will refrain from saying a lot about that because I see um, LBBC on May 8th is going to have a special session on uh, uh, genomic, um, is it a webinar or is it a Breast Cancer 360? Stay tuned to LBBC. They will be covering that in depth. What I would like to just quickly say, I cannot cover all of these things in the, the time I have allotted, so I just want to point out um, just a couple quick things on each subtype, what, where I think the most interesting activity is happening. With estrogen re receptor positive disease, this morning we heard a lot about CDK inhibitors. We heard about palbociclib and ribociclib, which are currently available. Abemocyclib is still waiting in the wings, and what's interesting about abemocyclib is it potentially might have application to treat people uh, who have had a lot of prior treatments. Um, that remains to be seen, uh, but that is one. Um, I think for many people with metastatic breast cancer, you start with the least toxic option first, and you hope to just stay with the, let's say, gentler treatments as long as possible. That is, a, you know, that is one of the potentials of these CDK inhibitors, um, so I would keep an eye on those. Uh, HER2 disease, it used to be that HER2 was the most aggressive subtype. Um, that really changed. With Herceptin, that was a huge, huge breakthrough. 
And oftentimes when you meet an outlier or somebody that has been living with metastatic breast cancer for a long time, many times that person has the HER2 positive subtype. Triple negative, I think one uh, area of interest would be immunotherapy. We don't see, with breast cancer, has not been a huge area for immunotherapy. There have been more advances in lung cancer and melanoma. Uh, when our speaker this morning, um, he talked about the many mutations of triple negative. And I think that is why it is a potential vehicle for immunotherapy because it is, uh, you know, it creates sort of a foreign invader, shall we say, to the body. And this, this opens the door to create antibodies, you know, to, just as your immune system would respond. So I do think that is an area to watch in triple negative breast cancer. Um, I have been going very quickly. If you wanted to know more about any of these things, um, both LBBC and then NBCN and SHARE after the top oncology meetings, which would be uh, ASCO coming up next month and San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in December, they will offer webinars and articles uh, detailing the key advances. And uh, share last year, I thought they had an excellent speaker in Dr. Maura Dickler from um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And the recording of that is online. So if you are interested, she's, it was a very, I felt it was a very patient friendly presentation. So do check that out if, if you want to know more than I'm able to tell you right now. So why is research so challenging with metastatic breast cancer? As we are, have said many times today, um, epidemiology is elusive. And um, you, know, we, what, you can't manage what you don't measure. And that is why we have to count everyone living with metastatic breast cancer while, we're still, while we are still alive. Mark is gonna talk a lot more about epidemiology, so I, I want to keep going because I don't want to take his time. We've talked about the petition. Do sign this petition, share it with your friends, and um, you know, hopefully we can create both awareness and action on that front. Now, research funding, consistent uh, research, another research challenge would be consistent funding. And we talked about this in our keynote session. Um, you know, just for those who may not know, the largest single, force, single source of cancer funding, cancer research funding, is our federal government. The National Institutes of Health, NIH, is a primary government agency for biomedical research. And you know, not just talking about the looming cuts, but between 2003 to 2015, NIH, NIH funding declined 22%. What did this mean? It, meant, it means grants did not get funded. It means a whole generation of talented researchers were not able to get jobs, did not come into the field. Mark is going, to take, is going to talk more about that, but I think we should all be very concerned about this proposed 2017 budget that calls for an 18.3%, I'll say that again, 18.3% of the NIH budget to be cut. And you know, this is why you saw the March for Science the other weekend. This is why people are marching. We need to support research. And I won't belabor this, but I think, um, Kent Osborne is one of the movers and shakers behind the San Antonio Breast Cancer Consortium. What I thought was most telling was the, the second half of this quote where he said that the NIH uh, budget cuts um, are affecting our, our ability to advance some of the most exciting discoveries to improve outcomes of patients as quickly as possible. Everyone in this room has a vested interest in improving patient outcomes as quickly as possible. Another research challenge, uh, or several, uh, time, money, and logistics. It can take between 10 and 15 years to develop a drug at a cost of uh, $800 million. That is a very sobering statistic. I do want to share that since I was diagnosed in 2009, by my own informal count, I have seen at least eight important uh, metastatic breast cancer drugs come onto the market, but it is a very slow, expensive process. Metastatic breast cancer research also can be more complex and can take longer. For early stage breast cancer and some other cancers, it can be faster to conduct uh, early stage um, uh, studies in animal models. Uh, metastatic breast cancer animal studies can take up to nine months, nine months to run a single uh, experiment. 
Uh, I'm going to, since uh, genomics are going to be discussed at the uh, LVBC uh, event uh, later, I won't belabor that. I did just want to mention in terms of clinical trials, if you are looking for a clinical trial, there is one resource you might want to know about is the metastatic trial search, which is something that the MBC Alliance helped make possible. It's on the LBBC website, it's on MBCN, MBCN's website, it's on the YSC website. This may help you, uh, it may be an easy way for you to find a subtype that matches, and uh, find a, a clinical trial that matches your subtype. Tissue is an issue in metastatic breast cancer research. Um, but there is, the good news about that is there is a way as patients that we can help. Um, some of you may have heard about the Metastatic Breast Cancer Research Project, or Metastatic Breast Cancer Project. They are here uh, at this conference. Uh, I urge you to go talk to them at their table. Uh, myself and a couple of my MBCN colleagues, uh, Shirley and our friend Jenny, we were among the first to participate in this, and it was very easy. We, we signed a content, uh, consent. Uh, it was very easy. We were able to do it online. Uh, allowing access to our medical records, and then we were given a spit kit. And um, the, the, what's really promising about this is all this information coming together. You know, it's, it's very easy to do, and it's a, it's a way that you can help others. So I urge you to check that out. If you have lobular breast cancer, uh, a lobular breast cancer tissue depository is being established with uh, Dr. Steffi Osterich at the University of Pittsburgh. And my colleague Shirley Mertz has, has worked closely with, with Dr. Steffi uh, in terms of um, uh, supporting her work. And you know, if you have questions about that, I urge you to, to contact, to, to, um, Shirley could, could help you out on that. For those with inflammatory breast cancer, the Inflammatory Breast Cancer Research Foundation at, I think in conjunction with Coleman at uh, Indiana University um, has a depository of uh, inflammatory breast cancer tissue, which is so important for good research. So those are, those are three um, projects that you can check out and um, you can help research with those. So um, the lonely world of metastatic breast cancer advocacy. Why do so few people focus on metastatic breast cancer advocacy? Well, for one thing, we're outnumbered, um, which in a sense is a good thing in that there are so many more people with early stage disease versus those of us uh, with stage four disease. I think in a way um, it's only understandable because we tend to, our perspective tends to be on what we know best. And if you were treated for early stage disease, I know I, you know, for a few golden weeks, I thought I, I possibly had early stage breast cancer, but it turned out not to be the case. During those few weeks, and some of you here, if you were treated for early stage, you might have experienced this. I thought, well, this is really going to suck, but um, I can get through this. It will be six months. I will be done, and then my life will go back to normal. Uh, well, of course, that didn't happen, but had that happened, I'm sure that my, pro my priorities would be on what impacted me in terms of, um, you know, I would, uh, I would want, I would probably be very interested in, say, survivorship issues. Um, so I think, you know, also I do have to say, before I had metastatic breast cancer, and I think many people would say this, I didn't know about metastatic breast cancer, and that's why I think programs like Hear My Voice are so great, because it's not only educating uh, people with the disease, but it's helping us explain it to other people. Uh, one big challenge, like we've been saying, is we don't have the, the data. Incidence and prevalence of metastatic breast cancer are unknown, so we are missing the basic tools for advocacy. So what can we do? Uh, we can share our story. Uh, the person on the slide where it says, this is why I advocate, um, that's actually Carla Harvey who is here at the meeting and her friend uh, Sheila McLown created this. It was something that Sheila shared on Facebook, of course, with Carla's permission. And Sheila uh, did several profiles you know, of, of people living with metastatic breast cancer and she shared on Facebook. And I thought this was so great because it opens the door to a conversation. I know oftentimes in many families, um, cancer is not something that we like to talk about uh, for especially um, you know, older relatives, 
They might have grown up during a time where you did not talk about cancer. That was, you know, that was your own problem and you did not share about it. And what I have found in, you know, sharing my own story is people sometimes don't, like if I have posted something on Facebook, people sometimes don't say something to me right away, but they will later contact me and say, you know, oh, I have a friend that has metastatic breast cancer. Could you talk to her? Could you share some resources? And of course, I'm happy to do so. Um, so educating yourself is important. Um, I think this is like the Hear My Voice program that we've talked about, um, and there are other opportunities as well. At the San Antonio Breast Cancer Consortium, there's the um, Alamo Breast Cancer Foundation, and every night during the conference, they have the hot topic session, and that's where they try and translate into plain English some of the scientific presentations so to help us understand them better. And um, it's, you know, I am, there's a formal program which I haven't participated in just because I haven't been able to spare the time to do it, but it's well worth checking out. Um, there's also, you could be a Department of Defense consumer reviewer. And um, basically you are sort of serving as a patient voice and you are, you know, looking at research, sitting alongside scientists, sitting along researchers, kind of, you know, providing your voice, and it's not only patients that are eligible to do this, but caregivers are eligible to be uh, reviewers as well. Um, um, let's see, um, moving right along. Um, so what about some additional resources for learning about metastatic breast cancer? Um, MB MBCN and LBBC uh, worked on a brochure for the newly diagnosed, which you can find here, and it is now available in four languages. It's in Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, Tagalog. I think I miscounted. You can tell I was an English major. I miscounted. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I left out French is coming. Um, and uh, there's the NCCN guidelines, which are available online. And um, these are, you know, we were very, MBCN was asked to uh, review these and provide feedback. And we were so uh, gratified that our feedback was incorporated. Um, the one thing I would say about the NCCN guidelines is um, I think they're fairly patient friendly. Um, if you're interested in, um, you know, it sort of goes through, if you are this subtype, you know, here's, you know, potentially how you might be treated. Um, it's quite, uh, I think it's, it's well worth seeking out. Um, there's the Metastatic Breast Cancer uh, Landscape Alliance, which I've actually included some material from that as I've been talking. Um, and Cure Magazine, which, um, it's a free magazine and it generally has um, patient friendly articles. It's all cancer, but uh, you can get that free. Um, you can sign up online to get the publication and they also have an extensive array of articles online as well. Breastcancer.org was very useful to me um, and many others. Um, they have a great publication on understanding your pathology report. So if you are newly diagnosed and you were looking for more information on anything I was saying about subtypes, it's a great resource, I would find it there. Uh, they also have an extensive array of patient forums and um, that's how I first met people online was from, uh, you know, if you go to the breastcancer.org, they have uh, forums by stage. There is one for stage four people and you know, any, any number of other different categories. So that's another one to check out. Of course, we have the Metastatic Breast Cancer uh, Network uh, website as well. Um, and I think, so uh, that was um, everything that I had to say. Um, I thank you for your attention. And now um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Hurlberg. So uh, Dr. Mark. <laughs> thank you. So Dr. Mark Hurlberg joined uh, Breast Cancer Research Foundation in October, 2015. And um, his primary role is to work closely with Dr. Larry Norton and Judy Gerber and BCRF's uh, world-renowned scientific advisory board to execute the vision and strategy for funding breast cancer research. Mark leads the execution of BCRF's $60 million annual, $60 million annual funding of grants focused on research to prevent, treat, and cure breast cancer. In addition to his role at BCRF, Mark serves as the chair of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance and was the past chairman of the International Cancer Research Partnership and the Health Research Alliance. Please join me in welcoming Mark. 
You're too gracious, thank you. So I think, Catherine, you went so fast, like we're like way ahead of schedule, <laughs> but it's good. Um, so today they asked me to, can you hear me with this microphone? Okay. So today they asked me to just talk about epidemiology. So I could talk a lot about lab research or clinical trials. There's a whole session uh, tomorrow about clinical trials. So, but today they asked me to talk about epidemiology. So that's what I'll focus on. But during the question section, I'm happy to talk about any of the other topics, lab research or, or clinical trials or what have you. So um, first of all, thank you, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, for having us here. Uh, the MedSec Breast Cancer Alliance was formed about three years ago, three and a half years ago. And it was formed because Shirley Mertz, and I don't see Shirley in the room, but oh, there she is. Shirley and Catherine and many other patients got together and said, you know, we need to do something about metastatic breast cancer. And um, if we keep doing it on our own, we won't be making much progress. So they said, we need all of us to come together. And they formed the alliance, uh, really, about, I guess, four or five years ago. They began the conversations, and about three and a half years ago, they said, Mark, would you help us actually get going? So I have had the privilege to help the Alliance get going, and I think we're doing okay, but we still have a long way to go to cure this disease. So with epidemiology, um, did you, anyone that is a cancer patient, did you know that your data is actually stored in a registry, it's de-identified and reported to the government? Did you know that? or? I don't, I don't think most people knew that. So similarly, if you get gonorrhea, HIV, or even the flu, those cases are reported to the government. A lot of the general public, I don't think, knows that cancer is a reportable disease. It's mandatory reporting. So most um, epidemiology, there's two sources. So it comes from hospital-based registries. And so that's where you get treated. They track some very basic information. Your, uh, demographic information, your age, uh, your stage of cancer, your type of cancer, what treatment you got. And then in hospital-based registries, they're mainly um, following how the hospital is doing. They, they count your case, but they're mainly following how's the hospital doing. It's sort of a quality control check. The, uh, this is uh, some of the information they collect, you know, very basic information. Your, again, your name, your sex, your date of birth, your address, things like this, um, data about your tumor type, the type of treatment you got, then how long you survive. So that's very, very basic hospital-based registries. But how we collect it at the national level is through state registries. So if you're um, treated at a community clinic, um, state, state registries cover not just hospitals, but um, they follow claims that are reported from your blood draws, from the prescriptions you fill. And this is how we collect data sort of across an entire state and then across the country. So there's two real programs that do this. So the first that many of you have heard about and what our petition is calling for is the SEER registry, which is S-E-E-R, uh, the uh, Surveillance Epidemiology Registry from the National Cancer Institute. It actually only covers what you're seeing on the slide here is only the ones in blue it covers only about 28% of the United States population, but tries to, at a population level, um, look at how many cases are among white people, among African Americans, among Latinas, and it just samples them. What you're seeing in green, or kind of lime green, is the Center for Disease Control Registry, and this is uh, the other states that aren't covered by SEER, and so every year or every two years, uh, the Center for Disease Control and the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute put out the number of cancer patients that were uh, diagnosed in every state, the number of patients that, were, that, that died from cancer in every state, and that's done through these state-level registries. So um, again, the SEER registries only sample what you're seeing in blue, so Georgia, a couple of places in California, Utah, New Mexico, and it's just sort of a surveillance. The reason that they only um, touch a few of these states is because it's actually very, very complicated to collect all this data from hospitals, from primary care doctors, from prescriptions that you're filling, and it's very, very expensive to monitor all this data. It's, um, there's actually a whole profession, you probably have never heard of this before, but there's a whole profession called certified cancer registrars, and their whole job and career, like a social worker or like a nurse practitioner, is to count cancer cases. And so certified cancer registrars work on this, I don't know exactly how the government came, uh, the government and SEER came up with these states, 
but it's trying to uh, have a little bit uh, geographic uh, distribution as well as ethnic and minority um, population sampling. And so they've picked these ones that you see in blue. Again, all the states report this, all the hospitals report this, um, but the ones that are used for really in-depth research is the SEER registries. The, the, the green ones that you're seeing are primarily just reporting out numbers of cases and things like that. It's not used for... Yeah, green's all the rest of the states. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry, about 45 of the states. And then the blue ones are um, the SEER registries. So um, all the states report the data, but only a subset of these are, again, the SEER registries are really useful for really deep research analysis. And that's the, the ones you see in blue. Louisiana, Georgia, New Mexico, Utah, California, Iowa, Connecticut, New Jersey, and I think that's it. Oh, Kentucky, I think I missed. So just re reiterating it, so the SEER registry, so we've been working with them, um, asking them to track recurrences. It's not a simple thing because people move you know, from one place in the country to another, um, but we've been working with them. So uh, the Alliance has been working with the SEER registries. How can SEER and the CDC, all the green ones that you couldn't see, sorry, uh, how can they begin to count and track recurrences? So as Catherine said, unless you're diagnosed with stage four from the very beginning, you're not counted yet in these registries. So we're working with them on how they might do this. Again, it's a challenge when you think of um, privacy laws and HIPAA compliance. It's not easy um, with those for them to just add it on, but they're working on it. Um, the other two projects that working, we're working on with the SEER registries is do, does the public or do even cancer patients know that they're tracked and counted? Most people don't know that, um, that it's a reportable disease just like most infectious diseases are. And what information would patients be comfortable with the government collecting and analyzing and studying? And then the third project that we're working on with them is actually trying to understand the financial implications of a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis, not at an individual level, but at a population level. So how many metastatic breast cancer patients are having challenges paying their bills or filing bankruptcy. And you can do this again at a whole population level, but again, only in those um, five SEER states that, that they cover. So again, just to back up a little bit, so the, the two registries are, so hospital-based registries that report in and state-level registries that look at hospitals as well as private practices and prescriptions and blood draws and those kind of things. So it's at the whole state level. But for really deep research, um, we work with the SEER registries, which does more than just report. They, they actually study trends over time, how many cancer patients uh, are diagnosed in a geographic region. You probably have all heard of different hot spots in the country like Long Island or Marin County in Northern California. And so SEER is more of a research effort, whereas the state-based registries are more of a, just a reporting effort. Is that, is that clear? It's sort of two different, two different things. So again, um, SEER and, and a few of you at the break earlier asked me, why aren't they counting the recurrences? Well, it's not that they don't want to, it's just not easy to do. Again, we're not all like living in one place for all of our lives. Um, we don't have um, socialized medicine or healthcare for everyone like they do in Europe and other countries where in, in other countries, your social security number equivalent, we don't, they don't use SSN, but your equivalent, you're tracked in other countries, in Sweden and in Europe that have socialized medicine. In the US, we don't have that. It's a different market, it's a different system. So um, the other project that the Alliance is working on, uh, beyond working with just the SEER registries, is we're working with individual hospitals. So we scoured with experts, um, uh, Dr. Yi and others who spoke earlier today, we scoured with experts what are individual hospitals doing to track recurrences because some hospitals do a very good job of this, not very many, but we found in Seattle, the Swedish Cancer Institute, um, the MB Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, and then a hospital system in France and in Germany and Sweden uh, do a really good job of tracking every patient that's diagnosed with breast cancer in their center, and then they follow them. Even if they leave the area, they try do their best to follow them over time all the way to when they have, if, if they have a recurrence and what their outcome is and how long they live. So, so far we've begun working with Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle. Well, we hope to work with MD Anderson and with these other countries. 
Um, this is some of the data that, uh, that has been reported by those places. So these are just five um, studies that they did, again, at the population level. Um, I can, we can send you all these literature if you'd like them. But um, several of these, uh, the, the five sites that I talked about in uh, Seattle and in, te in Texas and in Germany, France, and in the UK, tracked patients, early stage patients, over time. And this is, this is, if you look through the PubMed or other literature searches, this is all that we could find. But they've tracked how many early stage patients, uh, how they did over time, but they saw some of them had a recurrence, right? So um, on average, so the Seattle one, uh, Swedish didn't count the recurrence rate. That's why it has a yellow and question mark if you can see the yellow. Um, but in, in uh, MD Anderson's database, they tracked just under 7,000 patients with stage one, two, and three breast cancer and followed them over time. And 28% of them had a distant metastatic recurrence um, as they followed them. The Munich registry tracked 33,000 patients. They call them M0 in Europe. Um, but it's basically the entire city of Munich and anyone that was diagnosed with breast cancer. And M0 means they had uh, no mets at diagnosis, so stage one, two, three. And they followed them over time. And within uh, five years, 24% uh, of them had a recurrence. So when you hear these ranges that we think it's about 20 or 30% have a recurrence, this is some of the data that supports that. But again, we still don't have that, the actual accurate number. And so we're working with these hospitals, again, first with Swedish. Um, they had a poster in San Antonio, and they'll be publishing the work, hopefully in the next couple, uh, in the next month or two, we'll be able to publish what Swedish has been working on. No, so these five are hospital race registries, so it's just the people treated at that hospital. Well, except for Munich, it was the whole city. And that's the average population that they Yep. Yep. Yes, yeah, so she was asking, what do I mean by population level? So these, these data are from individual hospitals, not the state registries or the national registries I talked about, but these are five hospitals that tracked early stage breast cancer patients and tracked their recurrence. And she was asking what I meant by population level. And this was just the population they served. So at Swedish Cancer Institute, it was just under 3,000 patients. At MD Anderson, it was under, just under 7,000 patients. And this is just one study. They, many of them have many, many studies in this space, but not a lot of hospitals do this sort of longitudinal tracking of patients. And that's why the Alliance has been working very closely with Swedish. We hope to work with MD Anderson and these other um, European ones, because it's very, very challenging, again, to track. Uh, so Swedish is the best example in the country. They have the, the most robust data. They track every person that's diagnosed with breast cancer in their hospital, and then they follow their, their outcome all the way through. Even if they move from Seattle to somewhere else in the, in the country or in the world, they do their best to follow them and then keep their database up to date on how that patient's doing. And so. Um, this is um, five individual hospitals, except for, the, again, Munich is the whole city of Munich, not just one hospital. And, and actually, the, the one from France, in Nice, France, is um, three hospitals that do longitudinal tracking. But very few places do this sort of long-term uh, longitudinal tracking over time, because it's, it's very, very hard to do. So at Swedish, they have three people. Um, I've actually met all three of them. They're very amazing women, and two, two women and a man that they spend their whole career and their whole lives literally tracking and following this data. So it's, it's very, very tedious and very, very complicated, but, but they're dedicated to it. So switching gears just a little bit, so I'm happy to again ans answer any questions about epidemiology. So the Alliance is also working with lab researchers on how can we more rapidly advance lab research in metastatic breast cancer. I think you heard earlier this morning how challenging it is to study metastatic breast cancer. So the Alliance convened about 70 experts just over a year ago and asked the questions, what are the barriers? And we learned some of them are that some of the models that you use in the lab, either whether you're studying cells in a Petri dish or metastatic breast cancer in a mouse model or other animal model, that some of those, they're not very standardized. And so three or four labs around the United States know how to do it very well, but many, many labs don't know how to do it. And so one of the things that we're going to begin doing is training 
um, bringing the best experts together with, uh, thanks to the MESAC Breast Cancer Network and Teresa's Research Foundation, we're going to be bringing together the best experts that know how to study metastasis in the Petri dish and in lab models and train the other uh, labs around the country. The other key issue that we heard when we brought together these experts and patients um, about a year ago was clinical trials. So most trials today look at how do you, if you have a MET in your liver or your lungs or your bones, most trials today with testing a new drug look at does it shrink that MET, met? And a lot of drugs might not shrink it, but they might be very helpful for keeping it maintained and controlling it and stopping it from spreading to another new site or growing any further. And so if you just measure shrinkage alone, and um, Dr. Pat Steeg, who's at the National Cancer Institute, is really an expert on this, but if you just measure shrinkage alone, you might be missing the mark. And so that can't be your only uh, thing that you're monitoring in trials. And so we're trying to work with um, pharmaceutical companies, and then there are several FDA representatives there to say, can we bring in new endpoints to trials that don't just look only at shrink shrinkage and the rhesus scale is what it's called. And then lastly, um, the alliance is working, how can industry and academia work more closely together? So um, industry and uh, industry, what, what I mean by that is pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, and academic scientists used to work together very closely you know, 20 years ago when I was a kid, when I was in a lab. Um, you know, I actually tell people, it's kind of a, a funny joke, but when I, tell, I tell people, when I was 18, I literally wrote a letter, Dear Merck, could I please get a little bit of your calcium channel blocker to study in this little experiment I wanted to do? And they actually sent me the drug, and they sent me $5,000, and I did a little project. Um, today, because of so many regulatory things, and I don't mean to offend any of you if you're lawyers, but because of law, lawyers and, and regulatory things, it's very, very hard for university-based scientists to actually study the drugs that, that pharmaceutical companies have. And so one of the things the Alliance is trying to do is how can we help bridge partnerships so that more really smart and creative academic scientists can work together with industry scientists. And again, we don't have the, all the answers to that, but these are some of the things that we're working on. It's obviously a very complicated um, and long-term project. So these are just some of the people that we're working with. You probably know some of these doctors um, from around the country, Dr. Nick Wagley, I don't think he's here, but Corey's here from the NBC project. Um, and we continue the, the work in the lab and the clinical trial and the epidemiology settings. So as I, as I sort of wind down my part of the talk, I wanted to talk about medical research. I didn't hear all of Dr. Yee's talk this morning, but this is a bar graph of what, uh, how medical research in the United States is funded. And if you look at the three bars, so it's 1994, 2004, and 2012, and as you can see, uh, the funding for research in the United States didn't really change much between 2004 and 2012. And actually, if you adjust for inflation, um, funding for medical research in the United States has shrunk and not kept up pace with other investments in, uh, in uh, technology companies and things like this. But if you look at this, and I don't know if you can see the colors from where you're sitting, but the, the very most of the research in the United States is funded by the government, the National Cancer Institute, that's paid for by all of our taxes, uh, part, of your, you know, part of the government's budget. That's um, the middle blue parts there. The bottom part in green is, a, is the bigger part, is the industry, biotech companies, and pharmaceutical R&D. And then at the very top is foundations. So like where I work, the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, Susan G. Komen, American Cancer Society. We're a very, very small part of medical research funding in the US. So if you look at the entire bar, it's about 100, in, in 2012, it's about $120 billion um, dollars goes to medical research in the US. But nonprofit organizations is only about 4 billion of that 120. So even if uh, the nonprofits in this room Meta, Metaviver, Metasec Breast Cancer Network, Teresa's Research, even if we quadruple our budgets or 10 times our budget, we're just such a small, small part of medical research. And that's why it's so important to be advocating for the government to do their part and to not cut medical research funding in the country. The other big thing that I wanted to reemphasize is how complicated it is. So, you know, research spans the entire spectrum from very, very basic biology to prevention research to new treatments to quality of life research. 
But if you just look at drug discovery, and I think this was, Catherine, I think you mentioned this, but it was mentioned also by Dr. Yi, that if you're going to develop one new drug, you could be studying that for, first of all, a very long time, seven to 10 years, but that most uh, drug discovery research doesn't succeed. So you have a lot of failures along the way. And so this is just one example. So if you looked at 10,000 new uh, chemical entities for a drug, you would get to about five of them that might actually make it through to an IND disclosure and one of them getting to all the way to FDA approval. So again, it's very, very complicated. The estimates are that for every one drug, it's about 800 million to 1.2 billion is a, quite a range, but it's almost a billion dollars for every new drug that we wanna to bring to market. So medical research is very complicated, very expensive, and takes a very long time. And again, the main funder is industry and the government from all of our taxes at NIH and NCI. And you know, kind of the last thing I wanted to just mention is it's very, very complicated to be a scientist. You know, I left the lab bench uh, about 18 years ago, 16 years ago, but it's very, very complicated to be a scientist in the US. So you go to, you get your bachelor's degree, four years, you go to get your PhD, six or eight years. So by then you've been in college, you know, 10 to 12 years. Then you go and do a fellowship. And in the United States, and it's very unique here, it's not the same in Europe and other places, um, there's not a lot of job opportunities. There's not a lot of uh, faculty positions at universities. Um, only 23% of uh, biological or biomedical PhDs hold a faculty position today. And the time that they sort of finish their, again, they got their bachelor's degree, their PhD, did fellowship. By the time they get their first independent award, meaning they're sort of on their own and they're no longer being mentored, is uh, the average age of people getting that first NIH grant, they're 42 years old. So, I mean, what other profession does that really happen? I don't think even for physicians it's such the case. So. I think in the US we have a lot of challenges, not only with research funding, but sort of the entire research paradigm. Is it a priority for this country or not? And I think everyone in this room uh, obviously wants more research, but just trying to explain how important it is for us to advocate for scientists and for medical research funding. So I will stop there, sorry, Kathy. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. <laughs> And um, as, I m as I mentioned earlier, we will be taking questions from everyone, so please text them in. We'll be getting them from both our webinar audience as well as the in-person audience here. And Catherine, um, I think you should come up and join me. Yes. <laughs> and I'm wondering, Mark, while we're waiting for some of the questions to start coming in, if you could talk about some research going on on metastasis. Many people are very interested in that 7% number, and if you can um, talk about maybe some promising activities. Yeah, I mean, well, first, I think you heard a lot from Dr. Yi this morning, because I don't want to duplicate what he said, but, um, you know, it's, it's varies by subtype. Do most, do most people know that what type of breast cancer they had? Hormone ER positive, HER2 positive? Yes. Triple negative? Okay. Um, so there's a very exciting work. I think um, Dr. Norton and Dr. Garber, who chair the uh, Breast Cancer Research Foundation's advisory board, I um, think that they're, they're very excited about the new work in mTOR and CDK4-6 inhibitors for ER positive cancers. They think they, that's kind of a game changer and a welcome game changer. In um, HER2 positive uh, breast cancers, the um, combinations of therapy, so before HER2 positive cancers were very deadly in the 1990s before we had Herceptin, and Herceptin was a game changer for uh, prolonging life and stopping metastatic HER2-driven cancers. I think now we have other options, which is very exciting, and some of them in combination. Um, one of the things that I tell people, it's, it's my personal opinion, it's not the, the, the Alliance's opinion or BCRF's opinion, but I actually think that the combination of uh, Pergida, Pertuzumab, and Herceptin, which in metastatic patients, it came out about three years ago was the report, but extended life 16 months compared to people that got Herceptin alone. I think that's an under, appreciated advance, because a lot of these cancer trials in breast and other cancers, you're lucky if you get two or three months ex extension in, in the MedSec setting. So I think we're doing well in uh, ER-driven and HER2-driven cancers with some of the new things. And then with triple negative, um, I'm, I'm thrilled that there's a, a fair amount of work going on, um, not only with uh, the, the timing and the dosing of chemotherapies, but there is a fair amount of research going on with androgen receptor uh, 
driven triple negative breast cancers, which is a small percent, but um, androgen receptor, for those of you that don't know, AR, AR uh, positive or a androgen receptor is what the AR positive, it um, drives a lot of the prostate cancers around the country. And so there's several drugs that treat prostate cancer that might be applicable to AR positive, triple negative breast cancer. And there's several trials underway for that. Also with triple negative, of course, the PARP inhibitors, we were, we're lucky in the cancer world that just uh, last month there was a new PARP inhibitor approved for ovarian cancer, but it's being tested in triple negative um, breast cancers as well. Um, that's just some of the things that are underway. Um, you know, I do think that there's a lot of research going on finally, um, if you, uh, I think everyone in this room is, knows this, but what we need is the whole world to know this, is if you have a metastasis, get it biopsied, uh, know if it's changed from your primary uh, tumor. And if you're, if, if you're able to, then you know, donate that or sign up or allow that to be studied for, by researchers. So at BCRF, we're funding two um, clinical trials called the Aurora Project, one in Europe, and Aurora US and Aurora Europe. And we're trying to study 1,000 patients in US and 1,000 patients in Europe. And they're going to look at the primary tumor, the metastasis tumor, and blood draws in between and try to understand how cancer is changing. So there's a lot of work going on, um, but I think we still have a long way to go. Great. Um, we have a couple questions, actually, about if the government is requiring all cancers to be reported, why can't it be a reportable moment when it does turn metastatic? Well, hopefully that's what our petition will do. <laughs> um, but again, I don't think, so the people at CIR have been very, very collaborative and helpful. It's not that they don't want to do it. I think it's just very challenging. And te technically, how do they do it? You know, again, most people in the US don't stay in the same city uh, or state forever and ever. So when people move around the country, how do they track those recurrences? So I don't think that it's not that they want, don't want to, but how do they do it? And again, the SEER registries only sample 28% of the US population. It's those five or six blue states that I showed you on that earlier slide um, for really in-depth research. Again, every hospital reports out, every state reports out, but if you wanna do really in-depth research, the SEER registries only sample those 28% um, of the US population. Okay, I think people are struggling to figure out how that, how 28% is translatable to the general population. Can you tease that out a little bit? Yeah, so I'm not, a, I'm not a statistician, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I, I'll play one on TV, I guess. <laughs> um, but it's very, very, it's very, very technically challenging. But the idea when they design which states they're covering and which cities they're covering and, and studying in depth was that they would try to get as much of they could a representation of the US population. So the demographics, if you look across the US, is about 12% African American, about, was it 18% Hispanic? So they try to sample populations where they would get at least that uh, representation of uh, general demographics. So that's how they picked Georgia, Kentucky, California, a couple of states in the Northeast. Okay. Another question, um, Dr. Yi did touch, and he did a workshop on immunology. Um, is there any center in the US working on just boosting people's immune systems to fight cancer? rather than? Yes, so there's a, a lot of research. Again, we don't, ha we don't know, it's, I would say it's early stages, but the idea that you could stimulate your own immune system to attack the cancer is a, an area that's very uh, interesting. And it's working very well with drugs that stimulate the immune system for lung can a few lung cancers and a few melanoma subtypes. It's not for all melanoma or all lung cancer, just a couple of the subtypes of those diseases. In um, many settings, the idea, there, there are several studies that are ongoing looking at how you could balance improved nutrition, for example, to stimulate the person's immune system, reduce inflammation, um, uh, make sure they have the strongest immune system possible. But as well, in breast cancer, we are looking at drugs that might help stimulate the immune system. The challenge uh, with immune-based therapies, and it's a, it's a very exciting time, but still it's a very challenging time, you wanna have just enough immune stimulation, not so much that it causes autoimmune diseases, right? So. Um, the challenge, and, but in breast cancer, in metastatic breast cancer, is one of the things that they're looking at with immune-based therapies is how do you stimulate it, not just with a drug, but maybe there's things where you combine things like radiation therapy and then give the PD-1, PD-L1 type of inhibitors. So it's early days, but I think in, in breast cancer, we have a long way to go still with immune-based therapies. Okay. Uh, 
Some people are wondering um, how the Alliance and other organizations are working to open up the clinical trial el eligibility criteria. And if you could explain kind of what the problem is with criteria and then talk about what's happening. Sure. So uh, clinical trials, uh, the challenge with clinical trials um, uh, today, the, the challenge that many metastatic patients face is that uh, the trials are designed with very, very specific and very, very rigid criteria. And you can only have had this prior treatment or that prior treatment, you know, sometimes one, two, three, or four. And so the number of lines of prior therapies you've had is a challenge. The, um, and, and so the, one of the things the Alliance has worked on, first of all, is to make more trials information available. So the Alliance really helped breastcancertrials.org launch Metastatic Trial Search. It's this great search engine. I think it's a good search engine. It still has some, some flaws, but um, where you can put in the type of breast cancer you have, sort of your age, are you premenopausal, postmenopausal, and then where you have metastatic sites. Um, I think that more and more academic-based trials, so it's hard for pharmaceutical companies because they have to adhere to very rigid criteria for them to study new uh, molecular entities, new drugs in the way. Um, I think more and more academic institutions are understanding some of these challenges and they're doing their best, oh, and they're doing their best to try to overcome some of these barriers, but it's very complicated, sort of looking at number of lines of prior therapy, number of lines of prior treatments that might restrict you from being eligible to trials. Um, Catherine? Hello, how's that? Here, okay. So just one thing to add, this is not specific to the Alliance, but um, I know if you have brain metastases, that can often be an exclusion for a clinical trial. And I have seen, um, you know, people are addressing this. One thing I wanted to mention for those who may not know, the University of North Carolina actually has um, a dedicated, um, I will call it a brain metastasis center or clinic. And um, I think that was, that was very intrigued by that because um, it is, that is definitely uh, an area that, um, you know, can be very thorny uh, for clinical trials. Okay, I'm sorry, there's lots of questions coming in all of a sudden. Um, let's see. Um, people are wondering if, you know, there's a lot of privacy laws, et cetera, but do people really control their own samples and can they donate them to clinical trials was the specific question. Um, well, I mean, I can speak certainly from my own experience. Um, you know, yes, you do. Um, in terms of um, when my original tumor was biopsy, the treating institution stored that, and I was able to, I did have to sign a consent for it to be released. And oftentimes when you are treated, um, the institution itself will ask, um, you know, may they use this tumor? So uh, you, do, you do control it, and um, you also, um, what is exciting um, when we're talking about, um, you know, submitting, um, uh, uh, say, a blood sample, um, that is fairly easy in terms of you can go, you know, I am thinking specifically of what the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project is doing. And you can, uh, most cancer patients routinely have to have blood draws and um, people have been able to take the kit in and, and get a sample. So uh, my understanding is yes. Um, I'm not a legal expert, but my presumption would be that you do own that tissue and have some say over it. Okay. Mark, uh, someone asked if you could expand on the Aurora project that you discussed and how an individual might be able to enroll in that project. So it, it, it will be listed on clinicaltrials.gov and patients can enroll. Unfortunately, I think it's not yet open in the U.S. It's, it's in Europe, they already have about 100 of the 1,000 patients enrolled. But I think um, one of my colleagues is actually getting an update on that right now in Dallas. <laughs> so, um, but I think the uh, Aurora US project will be opening hopefully in June or July. Great, thank you. Um, other people are wondering about, uh, you 
mentioned a little bit about the financial costs of, of the, particularly the, some of the new therapies, and people are wondering about what is being done and what particularly is being done from an advocacy standpoint around drug pricing costs. Well, I think um, just fundamentally, um, as we've seen this week, I think um, the first priority is access to care in terms of what is our insurance situation going to be uh, for 2017. So uh, I think, you know, that would be the first, uh, right now, we, we don't know, I mean, we, we know it's bad now, could it possibly get worse? Um, the, and, you know, perhaps it will. Um, the other thing too is um, we, you know, we also need, um, you know, I think we need more drugs available to begin with and then we can, um, and then we can start, um, you know, getting into this. But we do look at financial toxicity. Um, that is something that we talk about all the time. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer for that. I wish that there were. I think it's heartbreaking, uh, especially when you read in the United Kingdom, some of these, um, particularly these HER2 positive drugs, they aren't approved on the national system. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a thorny issue. I don't think there's an easy answer for it. Yeah, I would just say from the Alliance perspective, we haven't yet tackled any policy issues, drug pricing or any other policy issues, including NIH funding. Um, the Alliance, if you don't know, has one staff person and a half-time administrative assistant, and then the rest of it is volunteers uh, Catherine, yourself, Kathy, myself, um, that have full-time day jobs but contribute part of their time and effort to the Alliance. But we haven't yet tackled any policy issues, but I know it's on our radar. And I think uh, it's a ripe area for advocacy, so I would, would kind of challenge <laughs> everyone in this room to get involved on, on where they think is comfortable. Um, are there initiatives or plans to get more ethnic minorities involved in clinical research? Yeah, so the Alliance is going to be launching, we don't yet have a formal name, I don't think, but it's uh, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance Accelerator or uh, Patient Insight Network, um, PIN for your, your PIN, like, right? <laughs> um, we're launching this new initiative to try and get as many metastatic patients as we can enrolled um, just to know how many people are out there. You know, we'd love to get, you know, 50,000, 100,000 metastatic patients all on board. And if you want to do a genomic study, we'll send you to Nick Wagley and NBC Project. If you want to do something more on the quality of life issue, you can work with Susan Love or the Cancer Support Communities, um, Cancer Experience Registry. Um, but through the Alliance's effort, we'll specifically be partnering with the community cancer centers and with um, safety net hospitals that, you know, the public hospital systems around the country, trying to get more um, representation from all, all groups of people. Someone was asking why not just use our social security numbers so <laughs> they can track um, metastatic recurrences. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not an epidemiologist. <laughs> I don't know uh, how the de-identification process goes, but um, I was told by one of my friends that, that is in the IT world that actually today they can pretty much, this whole idea of de-identification and privacy is kind of like a fallacy that, that smart computers can figure out, aha, that's you that just bought that new car or that new house. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know the, the whole system why they don't use social security numbers. Okay. I, if each of you would, would discuss just in your closing remarks, just say what your hope for uh, metastatic breast cancer research is in the next couple of years. Sure. Um, well, I think there's oftentimes people, um, perhaps, um, you know, they, they like to um, prematurely, I would say, um, characterize metastatic breast cancer as a potentially chronic disease. This is not a chronic disease uh, today in 2017. Um, it is my hope that someday that that will happen, um, but we still have much to do. The other thing that I hope as a patient advocate is to see more cooperation, uh, not only among uh, fellow patient advocates of all stages, but across all diseases. I think um, I have experienced this myself. Um, people, you know, first just to offer one point, 
Uh, breast cancer is second to lung cancer and heart disease as, uh, in terms of um, the leading cause of death in the, in the United States. And I know many people look at the attention given to breast cancer and they feel this is a problem solved. And you know, I will frankly say there is sometimes some resentment because, oh, breast cancer, you know, it gets all the attention. Well, we know that those aren't all of our stories. We know there's much more to do. And um, I think if I had to say one thing, I would say that the best science helps us all. Um, especially, you know, when we're going to be talking about kind of the future of genomic and personalized medicine, then we're not really talking about, well, this is breast cancer and this is lung cancer and this is prostate cancer. We were basically talking about, you know, covering the waterfront. And so I would hope, although certainly as uh, people living with the disease, we have a vested interest in advancing your, our own cause, I would hope that we would look beyond ourselves and do the best for all of us across all diseases. Yeah, but I guess I would say I hope that we can get more scientists um, funded to work on metastatic disease. You know, again, it's, I think as you heard, it's more complicated. It takes a longer time. So if you're studying you know, earlier breast cancer in, in lab models, you can do that in a few weeks or month. With, MESAC breast cancer studies, sometimes it's you know, eight, nine, 10 months just in some of the mouse models. Um, so if we can get more emphasis with academic scientists studying MESAC breast cancer would be my uh, one goal is to get more people, you know, more troops helping us you know, move the, the research forward. And we've made, it, we've made a, a great start. I think we have a long way to go. Dr. Matt Ellis at Baylor, um, George Riesfilo at Memorial Sloan Kettering, you know, Danny Welch in Kansas. We've made a great start with you know, a dozen or so of them that are very, very active and very want to, very actively want to make a difference. But if we can get more scientists involved, I'd, I'd be thrilled. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking both Catherine and Mark. <laughs> Just to note before we close that the slides that you saw today in this presentation and all the presentations will be on lbbc.org. Thank you.